Hello, and welcome back to the World Creativity and Innovation Week. We're so excited to have you join us today. Um, this afternoon, before actually before we get started, I just wanted to let you know, as you are listening to our presentation today, if you have questions or comments, you can put them in the chat uh, here, or you can also put them in the Q&A section. I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce our uh, sponsors for this amazing event, which has been wonderful. This last, uh, we started a week ago, uh, tomorrow it'll be a week, and this whole event leads up to the culmination to the big national event, or excuse me, the global event tomorrow. Um, but our sponsors for this event have been Haggerty and Haggerty Digital Services and my favorite art place. So we want to thank them so much for all their support and everything that they've done for us for this event. My name is Wendy. I'll be moderating this session for you. And today joining us is Jill Sonke uh, with her, her talk, her presentation today is why public health needs the arts to create healthier communities. So at the intersection of public health and arts and culture lies the potential for building stronger and healthy communities in America. Over the past several decades, evidence has mounted to demonstrate that the arts and culture have had measurable impacts on individual and community health. Today, innovation is taking root at the intersections of art, community, develop, cr development, creative placemaking, and public health throughout the nation. Creating Healthy Communities, Arts and Hub Public Health in America is a national initiative designed to accelerate this innovation to build healthy communities in alignment with our national public health goals. The initiative will expand the intersections of the arts, community development, and public health through strategic cross-sector collaboration, discovery, translation, and dissemination. So Jill, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Wendy. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to take just a minute to get my slides sharing. Oh, Wendy, it looks like you may have to enable screen sharing for me. Okay, sorry about that. It's all right. Bear with me for just a second. Yeah. All right, now I'll try that. Perfect, thank you. All right, excellent. So hi everyone, good afternoon. I'm really delighted to be able to join you all today from um, New York City. And probably like where you are today, this city is built on unceded land. And I wanna take just a minute to acknowledge that both the devastating history of this land and the wisdom and traditions of the Lenape people who are the owners of this land. So I'm gonna talk with you today about the importance of the arts to both individual and collective health and well-being, and about why the public health field needs the arts more than ever today. And knowing that you all bring wonderfully disciplined, uh, diverse disciplinary backgrounds and perspectives today, I'm gonna to start with just a little bit of Public Health 101 uh, to help some, set some of the context for our conversations today. So as individuals, we exist in the context of others, our families and friends and the organizations, the communities, systems, policies, and cultural environments that we're a part of are significant influences on our health. This understanding is really critical to how public health professionals design health promotion programs. And we'll consider today how the arts address every level of this socio-ecological model. And over the past century, the field of public health has moved through several distinct waves that reflect distinct perspectives on population health. So the concepts of health equity, root causes, and the social determinants of health have been increasingly taken up in public health in the US over the past couple of decades in what's considered the fourth wave of public health. But even with this focus, much of public health research and practice continues to prioritize individual and interpersonal level interventions. But recently, many in the field of public health are calling for a fifth wave, which is a paradigm in which the social ecological environment generates health through a holistic and collaborative frame. So this fifth wave view recognizes that there's no single sector intervention or mechanism that can support health and health equity, but instead a focus on a culture of health across sectors, disciplines, policies, and geographies 
is needed to increase the pace at which really critical population level issues can be addressed. And within this perspective, we understand that moving the needle on population health requires collective action or social change. And that change has to take place around the upstream drivers of health inequities, things like racism, collective trauma, and many other systemic inequities. And similarly, the growing focus on health equity and public health highlights the need for approaches that support individual health and address upstream drivers of health outcomes, including structures, systems, environments, and policies. So these kinds of interventions require innovative, collaborative efforts that are responsive to culture, to lived experience, and to community assets. And as a sector, arts and culture offers rich ground for precisely this kind of collaboration and innovation. So as you probably know, the arts have long been used as a means to communicate with the public, to influence behaviors, and to fuel social movements. Artists are influencers, both within communities and across populations. The arts uncover and illuminate issues. They engage us emotionally and intellectually. They challenge assumptions. They call out injustice. And they influence collective action. And we know that artists have long been, the kinds, been agents of the kind of cultural, social, and behavior change that we need today. From the explosion of artistic expression within the Harlem Renaissance to the AIDS quilt in the 1980s, which raised awareness of the scale and impact of HIV, as well as the Broadway play Rent in the 90s, which played a major role in reducing stigma and increasing HIV testing, to knitted pink hats in 2018, which cultivated solidarity and protest of the widespread deprecation of women by men in power, and the music and the design that fuels the Me Too and the Black Lives Matter movements today. So public health calls this the diffusion of innovation, which is a behavior change theory. And we can also just call it art and recognize it as art doing what art does. And today as so many people are reaching to the arts to cope with social distancing and the ongoing stresses of COVID-19, the relationships between the arts and health, I think, are more visible and visceral than ever. In this pandemic, the arts have been really central to connection, coping, and communication for so many people. And now they're being engaged in really interesting ways in recovery and rebuilding efforts. So throughout the pandemic, musicians from around the world have been singing and performing from balconies, People have flocked to massive online music gatherings like those that DJ Denise and the CDC and Michelle Obama collaborated on. In these events, people experience joy and connection and the artists also use their platforms to communicate critical and accurate health information from agencies like the CDC. And I totally love this one. Charlie D'Amelio's TikTok dance about staying grounded and staying home has been viewed over 10 billion times. 95,000 of those views were within the first 10 minutes that it was posted. And this video has led to the creation of more than three and a half million unique hashtag distance dance videos, which have collectively been viewed more than 18 billion times. So this is extraordinarily powerful and effective health communication. And in 2020, Charlie was named one of PR Week's 50 health influencers. In addition, collaborative community songwriting projects like the Lip Lift Up Louisville project have provided communities with ways to experience connection in the midst of isolation. And they also have better positioned these communities to collaborate in recovery and rebuilding efforts. So within this pandemic, the arts have also been engaged for widespread and rapid communication by the World Health Organization, by the United Nations, by the CDC, and by the NEH, NIH. So these agencies who lead our national and global public health systems recognize that the arts can influence health behaviors and that they're essential to our well being and our resilience in challenging times like these. And artists are, as ever, rising up to express their own and our collective outrage at the racism that persists and is a major public health crisis in this country. 
I want to harken back to 1964 when Nina Simone wrote the song Mississippi Goddamn after learning that Ku Klux Klan members had bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama and killed four little girls. In response to this tragedy, Simone felt that she had to say something in her words to express or explode. She described ransacking her garage and trying to make a gun. And when her husband reminded her that she didn't know anything about killing, she ran to her piano and wrote Mississippi Goddamn in under an hour. This song was recorded when she performed it in March of 1964 at Carnegie Hall in front of a mostly white audience. The recording was then released as a single and it became an anthem during the civil rights movement. It was banned in several Southern states and she performed it in front of 10,000 people at the end of the Selma to Montgomery marches when she and other black artists, including Sammy Davis Jr., James Baldwin and Harry Belafonte crossed police lines. So today artists like Beyonce and Dave Chappelle and many others in the public eye are using their platforms to drive action. And artists in communities and even local governments are doing so as well. And these works and acts of art matter. Today, as they have been throughout our human history, artists are driven to create in response to injustice and to drive critical dialogue to, to influence collective action and social change and to make life better and healthier for us all. So today as our public health systems recognize and work to address racism and other social factors as critical public health issues, public health needs artists to help make the changes that will create health and health equity. And we see today in so many ways in which the arts are impacting health issues and conditions that limit health. One really great example is the Porchlight Initiative. This program is a collaboration between the City of Philadelphia's Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services, Philadelphia's incredible mural arts program, local artists and community members. Centering community members as partners, the initiative creates large scale murals to address stigmatized mental health issues, including substance use and trauma. Within the program, local artists work with community members to create murals that depict local experiences and concerns. And the program is designed to increase inclusion and, collect and connectedness. It's also designed to build understanding of mental and behavioral health issues, to reduce stigma, and to encourage empathy and resilience in the community. So a Yale University study found that over two years, the program resulted in a sustained increase in social cohesion and trust, reduced mental health stigma, and a decrease in the rate at which participants used secrecy to avoid stigmatization. So for me, this program exemplifies the reciprocal benefits the arts can create at both the individual and the collective levels. And a really rapidly growing body of research is highlighting other benefits like these. Dr. Daisy Fancourt, who's at the University College London in the UK, has been studying the impacts of arts participation in health in the UK for the past seven years. Using longitudinal big data sets, Daisy's found significant population level associations between arts participation and better health outcomes, including that going to concerts or visiting museums or galleries just once per month can reduce the risk of depression in adults over 50 by 48%. Similarly, doing, doing so just every few months can reduce the incidence of age-related disability by 46%, having a greater protective exercise, uh, pr protective effect than exercise even. And children who show marked creativity are 52% less likely to be maladjusted. In addition, people who engage in arts and cultural activities and in doing, including doing things like going to concerts and singing in choirs or even doing creative things at home are 14% less likely to die early than, than those who don't. In other words, they live longer. So these studies are highly controlled, of course, for things like education and socioeconomic circumstances and the findings hold up across all socioeconomic populations. And these findings have, have contributed to the establishment of social prescribing in the UK. 
a system wherein medical providers can prescribe arts activities and social activities, including music lessons and dance class, and the national health system pays for people to participate in those services. So Dr. Fancourt and I have recently established the Epi Arts Lab, which is a national endowment for the arts research lab at the University of Florida to extend her work from the UK to the US and hopefully to drive policy change akin to social prescribing in the US. Our first findings are out now in a preprint and we have three more manuscripts about ready to come out. Um, our initial studies highlight associations between arts participation and well-being and depression, along with patterns of arts participation across demographic group, groups in the US. So I'm gonna shift gears and share a few resources that we've designed to support work at the intersection of the arts and public health. And as Wendy mentioned in the introduction, over the past four years, we at the Center for Arts and Medicine have been working in partnership with Art Place America and many people throughout the country to build a field of arts and public health in the US and to call for cross-sector collaboration to address critical public health issues. This translational initiative gathered the knowledge of over 300 practitioners and thought leaders and artists and undertook a body of resource, research to create an array of resources that translate knowledge and evidence into practice and policy. One of the primary resources that we created is the Creating Healthy Communities Through Cross-Sector Collaboration White Paper. This report focuses on five key public health issues, collective trauma, racism, mental health, social isolation, and chronic disease and offers examples and recommendations for how the arts can address these issues. I wanna share with you one program example from the paper to illustrate what it looks like when the arts work to address critical public health issues. In this case, an upstream driver of health inequity like racism. So this is Hannah Drake from Ideas X Lab in Louisville, Kentucky. On her first visit to Senegal, Hannah, who's a poet and community organizer, immediately noticed that, and this is her quote, every day I look, everywhere I looked, on billboards and on art, I saw myself. There was never a question of whether I as a black woman exist in this space. So when she returned to her Smoketown neighborhood in Louisville, which is the oldest African-American neighborhood in the city, she was struck by the absence of representation and the, as well as the prevalence of predatory advertising in the community. And when she mentioned this at a community meeting, she found profound agreement among other residents who were, again, a quote, tired of people trying to sell death in their community through predatory advertising. So in response, Hannah and her colleagues from Ideas X Lab, along with the Smoketown Neighborhood Association and the Louisville Metro Department of Public Health and Wellness, collaborated to create the One Poem at a Time initiative. This initiative replaced dozens of predatory billboard advertisements in Smoketown with beautiful photographs of its residents, and each featured a different and powerful six word poem written by community members. One of the impacts of this work is that one poem at a time brought Smoketown residents together for ongoing collective action against racist practices. And soon after the initiative launched, the community not only prevented the opening of a new liquor store, but also changed citywide policies regarding how residents are notified about and can intervene around new store openings. And additionally, one particular one poem at a time billboard, which said, you are worthy, worthy of everything, led residents to create, to request a Smoketown is worthy of everything mural, which went up in 2018. So one poem at a time for me really exemplifies the ability of community led arts based initiatives to generate changes that produce better health. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the incredible team of writers that created the white paper. This, the work of this team also resulted in the development of an evidence-based framework for using the arts in public health. 
So developed through a complex two-year mixed methods study and grounded in the so social ecological model that we started with today, the arts and culture and public health framework illuminates evidence-based links between arts participation and health outcomes. As you can see in the blue boxes on its right side, the framework suggests six different and primary ways in which the arts can work in public health. And in the middle, it offers mechanisms by which the arts can do these things. The framework then expands to identify 59 different health outcomes that can be impacted by arts and cultural engagement or interventions. You can see a few of those outcomes here, and you can also access all of them on the web version of the framework. On that website, you'll see all of the outcomes as well as key examples of the evidence that supports them. So since a year ago, March, we've also created an array of resources as a part of our COVID-19 arts response, including local, state, and national governmental advisory briefs and an extensive COVID-19 arts response repository. You can use this repository to find artists, organizations, and projects, as well as media and other resources for using the arts to, to address COVID-19. And so I wanna close this afternoon by noting that both the public health and arts sectors throughout the world have always worked to create stronger, healthier communities. But what we need more of is the full power of their combined strengths. And I believe that as our public health systems more fully recognize and embrace the arts, that the creative sector will grow and cross-sector collaboration will bring fully to bear the power of the arts to create healthier and more equitable communities in the US and around the world. And that in the not too distant future, we'll all share an understanding that just like exercise, good nutrition, and wearing a seatbelt, the arts are good for us and our resources that we have at our disposal. So I'm gonna pause there. Thank you so much for your attention. And I'd like to invite dialogue. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you so much. That was so interesting. Uh, let me get us coordinated here. Uh, that was so interesting, Jill. And I, as I was listening and, and you were talking about the different artists and the way that we all pulled together and that they coordinated, I had the tremendous pleasure of working with the Broadway podcasters uh, a couple of months ago for a global event that we were doing. And when Broadway shut down, obviously the actors had no jobs and nothing to do. And they were, a group of them came together and started podcasting and really using their voices to further uh, not only the, the arts that they were interested in, but the different hobbies and things that they were also drawn to. And it was a fascinating thing to watch them all um, kind of pivot and, and redirect themselves, just like the many things and the many artists that you highlighted. Yeah, it's true. And it's been interesting to see, as I mentioned, um, I, I pretty much every major federal public health agency in some way recognize and turn to the arts, the World Health Organization, NIH. I mean, it's just been extraordinary, the recognition. Um, in my experience, and I've been working at the intersections of the arts and health for 27 years, um, but in my experience, what happened last March when we moved into lockdown, um, the ways in which people visibly reached to the arts was unprecedented. I mean, I think, I think the, the connection, the relationship between the arts and health um, really has never been so visible and so widely understood. Um, so it, it's an extraordinary moment for us. And, and yes, I think artists are finding um, some new and different roles today, um, which, you know, again, I think is, is going to play out in the public health sector in really extraordinary ways in the coming years. Well, and I, yes, and I think that just with so many of the presentations that have been on during this particular uh, event that so many people talking about, we, you know, we don't know what the new normal is going to be, but I think we have so much more of an appreciation. I don't think people ever thought about, I mean, not to, you did, because it's your job and that's what you work in is arts and medicine, but I think we take it for granted 
so much. And, um, you know, Jerry Manal, who runs my favorite art place, and we were talking the other day about how much, how important art is, but it's just, you just, you just take it for granted. And I think so much is changing with COVID. We're not going to take a lot of those things for granted anymore and people will see the value. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't share in the presentation, but Daisy Fancourt, who I mentioned from University College London, started a longitudinal study before lockdown in the UK. So early in the COVID pandemic, she initiated a study that collected data from people every single week about their activities and their mental health and well-being. And she enrolled, I don't know where she what number she's ended up on or is at to date. But um, last I knew there were over 90,000 people in the UK consented to this study. And she did an analysis um, of 70,000 of those people who had completed the survey on a weekly basis in the UK and found, and of course this is a huge number. It's a, it's a huge oversampling of the population, right? Um, and she found among those people that 21 0.4% of people in the UK were engaging in the arts more than they had pre-COVID. Um, so, you know, again, we, we see it in um, statistically through this research, as well as anecdotally through everything we're seeing online and, you know, and in our neighborhoods, you know, I, there are people driveway singing in my neighborhood and sidewalk chalking and, you know, all those things. It's a, it's refreshing. It's a different way that communities are coming together that we haven't had to come together in a long time. Yeah. So you also mentioned in your talk about uh, social prescribing. Um, can you talk more about that? Uh, where what it is and and where is it happening? Yeah. So social prescribing is happening in the UK. It's well established in the UK now. It's also happening in Canada, Australia, about five Scandinavian countries. Um, and there has been a pilot um, which will be post-COVID ongoing in the state of Massachusetts. So there's also a lot of dialogue um, bubbling up in the United States about social prescribing. Um, so it is a system wherein care providers can literally prescribe social activities, including arts and cultural activities. So a lot of the patients who participate in these um, systems are folks who come to primary care um, for sort of lower to mid-level complaints. And often those sorts of um, complaints that are related to sort of not thriving, not you know, being well in general, often can be related to loneliness or isolation, you know, low levels of, of depression, um, things that you don't necessarily want to maybe medicate or intervene you know, significantly for. Um, so those care providers can refer those patients to a link worker. And in the UK, thousands of link workers are employed. And those are folks who meet with the patient and hear about their interests and connect them with resources in their communities. So they'll connect them to a community choir or a pottery class or a volunteering opportunity um, or another social group. And then the health system pays for those activities and that information is a part of the health record as well. Um, so they've been able to do some really great research in the UK that's shown the incredible economic benefits, savings to the, to the primary care system. And um, it's significantly reduced the burden on primary care in the UK um, and has led directly to some really compelling health outcomes. So our Epi Arts Lab is designed not only as a research lab and research initiative, um, but will, is also a policy initiative in that we're driving dialogues around social prescribing and what that could look like in the US. We recognize that the places where it's really well established um, have very different political, social, economic, and cultural context, right? They've socialized medicine. The arts are often more supported by government in those places. So. This is a really interesting moment for us, especially at, you know, where we are in the pandemic, um, to be having dialogues about what something akin to social prescribing could be in the United States. So we're, we're hosting quarterly social prescribing happy hours with um, folks from across sectors and policymakers, and there's a tremendous amount of interest and energy in it. So we're really hoping that we'll see more happen in the United States. 
Well, that is so fascinating. And we certainly are, uh, it sounds like for something like that, our, the communities are going to also have to step up and, and I don't want to say demand, mm. but uh, demand <laughs> <laughs> for lack of a better term, uh, you know, some think programs like this to happen because, um, you know, especially in our, uh, older populations and that have been very isolated during this whole pandemic, that these would be amazing opportunities for them, but they just don't have the resources to find out how to get involved. Yeah, there are a lot of barriers to arts participation. Um, one of the, actually the first study out of the Epi Arts Lab is um, called Who Participates in the Arts in the United States? And we've, we've um, looked at demographic, across demographic groups and who participates, who doesn't. Of course, the social gradient that, that has been well established um, was validated in that research. But interestingly, we um, looked also at interested participation and non-interested non-participation, or sorry, interested non-participants, those who would like to participate but don't and why, and uninterested non-participants. So um, we've begun to drill into that. What are the barriers to, um, to arts participation in the United States? And not surprisingly, a lot of it has to do with structural racism, right? Um, so we're, we're looking more deeply in our research at those issues as well. So speaking of that, what about some opportunities? What if you have some um, professionals that are interested, some artists that are interested to work in the public health uh, in, in this type of program or process that you're talking about? Do they need special training or degrees or what would they need to be able to, uh, to work in this type of a, a system? Yeah, I think that's a yes and no answer, right? Um, you know, artists, as I've mentioned throughout history, artists have always addressed issues of health and well-being. It's what artists do. They take on important issues in our in our cultures. Um, so I think, you know, to a large extent, artists are always going to, you know, continue to think about, address, and try to drive change around issues of health. And today, of course, we're thinking of health differently in relation to the social determinants and the upstream drivers, you know, things like systemic racism and other inequities. Um, so artists are always going to work in that space. Um, but as artists want to work more formally in collaboration and in partnership with public health professionals, and I think there's incredible potential there. We see it in other countries. We're actually way behind in the United States in regard to the ways in which the arts are used in public health. It's changing fast. Like public health is, is really taking note of the arts right now. And so lots is happening. Uh, but compared to other parts of the world, we tend to be behind in that space. So as those collaborations increase and as public health professionals are calling on artists and arts organizations to partner formally. Um, you know, experience and training can be really useful. You know, there, there are sort of theoretical frames that, you know, public health professionals use to understand health issues and to try to impact health issues. And so it's really helpful for artists to have some level of understanding um, of those kinds of ways in which public health folks think conversely public health folks need to understand the arts and how artists think. So there's, I think, a necessity for cross education and knowledge sharing across those sectors. Um, and right now we're seeing quite a few programs bubbling up. Um, we have a national uh, community of educators um, for arts and health. And there are seven members right now from major universities in the United States that are starting arts and public health graduate minors or certificates. We have a graduate certificate in arts and public health at the University of Florida. Um, and we're far from alone in that space of educating. And the reason those educational programs bubble up is because students, you know, people want that training. Um, so I really see this space opening up and developing and a lot happening. Um, so again, I, I want to come back to my yes and no in that, um, you know, there will always be work by artists in this space and, and that won't require particular education, but the education that's becoming available will make more um, professional opportunities for funded collaboration available. Um, I always kind of chuckle when I think about the 
one of the first times I was in Uganda, I, I did research in partnership with Makere University in Uganda um, on the extraordinary ways in which they center artists in public health in that country. They have done so since the 1950s. And I've heard a handful of time artists say, thank God I'm an artist, I can always work. And that's because they're working in the public health sector. You wow. know, it's just every, every public health team has the arts. There's, you know, tons of radio dramas and telenovelas and community-based theater programs and graphic novels, comic books. I mean, there's just um, no end to the ways in which the arts are used there. In fact, the, the Ministry of Health, anytime a musician becomes really popular, they immediately contract with them to ensure that um, there will be at least one song on every album and in every concert um, that's developed as a public health messaging um, campaign in partnership with the Ministry of Health. So they recognize that artists can facilitate, like Charlie D'Amelio, the TikTok video, mm -hmm. that artists can facilitate mass communication much faster than a public health um, person can. Well, that's that's fascinating. And I think that uh, so I can see what you're saying that we're kind of behind the times there because it always felt like art in our society, especially with the health and the health and wellness, is that it was just a lucky few that stumbled across having, a, you know, their piece of art displayed in the hospital lobby. <laughs> And, and that clearly is not what it is. And so how would a, how would someone who say is already uh, established an artist or they're wanting to, uh, to look into offering services or becoming involved with a, a community or organization like this, so they're not in school anymore, a little bit more seasoned, uh, how, would they, how would they find out how they can get involved? There are some really good resources coming out right now. I mentioned our white paper, which is a, a good resource in our COVID-19 um, advisory briefs. Those materials specify ways in which um, you know, people can strike up partnerships in their own community. And actually a really incredible body of work just was released um, on Friday by the National Endowment for the Arts. It's called We Making. It's a theory of change document and there's actually a set of five documents um, that look at, at the role of the arts and social cohesion in relation to well-being and communities. So those resources, again, are great, um, provide great guiding frameworks for how artists can um, strike up those kinds of collaborations and partnerships. Um, but again, in a community, you know, I, one thing I want to say is I think um, I think it's really important that these partnerships are based on a mutuality of professionalism. You know, in the United States, we've um, there exists a rut in which the arts are an add-on, or the artists are asked to volunteer to do a little part of a thing because they love doing art anyway. You know, I mean, just um, terrible ways in which artists are undervalued and not appropriately compensated for their wisdom, for their experience, for their creativity and innovation and time and work. Um, so I think it, it, there are um, some resources right now that are really um, elaborating on some ways in which those partnerships need to be mutual and ways in which artists can strike up those relationships um, with the public health sector. So it sounds like to me, very typical happening in this post pandemic world is that there are so many opportunities, but people just kind of have to think outside the box a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do agree, Wendy, I think in general, you know, we're, we're thinking cross disciplinarily more than we did 20 years ago. Um, so I think Artists have always thought out of outside of the box, but now I think there's a little more um, opening and welcome to that kind of thinking across a range of sectors. Right, I agree. They, yeah, the, the artists are not the ones that aren't being the creative ones, but sometimes they, you know, not having that creativity to think about how does this apply in different worlds, but everybody kind of coming together and saying, yes, this is an important piece. And how do we, how do we bring in these different pieces to make things better for our communities and our population? So thank you, Jill, so much. This was such an interesting presentation. And I'm so excited to hear about all the different things that are going on and the ways that the world is changing and the way that we're making 
health and well-being better for our communities, our country, and globally as well. Thank you so much, Wendy. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Thanks. And so anybody can reach you. Uh, how do they reach you? Sure. You can find me easily on the University of Florida website. I'm Jay Sonke at ufl.edu. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Thank you for spending time with the World Creativity and Innovation Week event. This is a great place to be able to talk about this. So thank you so much. Thank you.